Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 100. My name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And we got to 100. 100 official we did it. episodes. Uh, we made it's it. more like 160 total recordings. <laughs> Some of them I didn't count as official, more or less arbitrarily based on my wisdom at the time. Anyways, we have reached a round number. And we've done it by swinging all the way back around to the beginning, because the first episode of the podcast was also about PAX East. I was sort of wondering if I oh, should... Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember with Wes? That's right. We just like said, hey, let's talk about PAX East and record it. Yeah, well, I floated the idea of a podcast. I'm like, I didn't know if I really wanted to do a podcast. I kind of wanted to keep it to, to writing and... Wes surprised me by buying a couple of, of microphones so that we could podcast. And I was like, hey, just give it a try. And it was super fun. And now we're years later and we've reached 100 episodes. So that's cool. Yeah. I was trying to think of if I should do something special, like really like try to do a big celebration podcast for 100. But then I realized, <laughs> you know, the symmetry of, of PAX East framing it both ways good enough for me <laughs> you're not going to do a clips episode for number 100 <laughs> i thought about it for about two seconds and then i thought about how much work that would be how many hours that would take and i immediately rejected that idea that would take so long i don't yeah. even know how many hours that would take you know you can simulate your own clips episode just you know Go to the page and randomly click on the middle of episodes and listen to some clips. <laughs> then it feels yeah, about just, clip just length. Pull up, Clicked on pull another up ran episode. Random dot org, get a random number from one to a hundred, and then pick a random timestamp, and there's a clip. <laughs> yeah, you make your own DIY clip episode. That's a terrible idea, but it would probably result in some interesting results. I expect people would get through two and then give up. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it'd be very interesting. So yeah, we went to PAX East. You went on for one day. I went for two days. I was planning on going for on a third, but I woke up and I was kind of congested and I had a sore throat. And I'm like, well, I don't really have. I didn't. I didn't have anything I was dying to get to on Sunday. And I'm like, well, I better. I better take it. You know, play it safe in case uh, I did catch something. Yeah. But I think it was just allergies because we, we went disc golfing on Saturday and we're outside a lot. And now I've noticed that every time I've been outside for any amount of time, I get congested a little while later, you know, a little bit congested. So I don't usually yeah, get I, spring I had some allergies. Of that. I had some of that this past weekend in Boston. The pollen must have been bad this year. Yeah. This is only like the second time in my life I've had noticeable like spring or fall allergies. So hmm. it must be real bad. I guess my entire backyard is flowered, so that should tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> I looked out, and I'm like, I don't even remember that tree having flowers. I guess it did. See, this is why Mark is the thoughtful gamer, not the thoughtful gardener. <laughs> That's very true. I am a uh, haphazard gardener. I'm fine with nature running its course. I think that looks great. You know, we go we go to the mountains and, and the forests and the, the wild fields and plains and we see what it looks like when you know people don't do anything at all and it looks great so why not do the same strategy in my own yard uh <laughs> there may be competing theories in the household though i don't even know why how did i get on gardening oh yeah because uh, why i didn't go to PAX allergies and you didn't yeah, go sunday so, yeah there we go uh anyways but in those two days i managed to get a lot of games played i managed to get a lot of games that i really wanted to play played um, and there were a couple surprises and a couple that were solid as I expected and some net runner. So, uh, let's get into it. Let's talk about, let's talk about the big game of the year, the big hype game. Everyone's talking about, I think Tom Vassell immediately put it on his number as his number one game of all time. Wow. I think pre-wide release it was already in the top 30 on board game geek that's arc nova uh, which we got to play is my second time playing it. it was your first time i'm curious mm -hmm. what you thought of it i enjoyed it it was fun it was a interesting 
puzzle. I hadn't seen that kind of sliding action, not programming, but you've got a set of actions that get more powerful the longer you've gone since using them. So you're kind of trying to cycle them around. Um, that was cool. It's kind of and the then, uh, it's kind of the Puerto Rico Twilight Imperium thing, just for like individual actions instead of you know yeah. selecting amongst you know amongst the group. Kind of like that. Kind yeah. of the same idea. Actions getting more powerful the longer you don't take them. Yeah. So that was cool. Kind of seeing how you planning out how you gonna are gonna build your board and the the play loop of you build something and then you draw some cards and then you play some animals was inter- was fun. Um, I thought the association and sponsor parts were a little clunky because you got to do those like once per round or once per break until, you know, later in the game. Um, so you kind of chose, you know, which, which one am I going to do now? And then I ignore that card until we reset everything. And I kind I would have liked more sponsor cards. I don't know if we just drew a bunch of animals, but it seemed like the animals dramatically outnumbered the sponsor cards. Yeah, I think I did see a higher ratio of sponsor cards in my first game. I don't know which one is more accurate to the actual ratio in the deck because it is a massive okay. deck of cards. Yeah, I would have liked to see a little bit more of those to kind of help shape a strategy, but. As it was, I guess you're also kind of heading towards the conservation goals as things to work towards. Mm-hmm. But it was enjoyable, very much a group single player game, almost no interaction, but it was fun. I would not rate it my number one game of all time. I enjoyed it. I would play it again. I probably wouldn't buy it. Yeah. I do think it is a thoroughly pleasant game insofar as every time you do something it feels good right so it sits alongside like pulsar castles of burgundy like everything you do is yeah castles of burgundy is more sedate i guess and more kind of marginal but these games that are just constantly rewarding you not necessarily with points or things like that although some of them do but things that make you feel like you've accomplished something and so in that sense it's very it's very breezy. It's it's kind of sandboxy. You kind of just fiddle around and do what you want to build your zoo and go for different uh, emphases. You're able to accomplish a lot. Like you're kind of able. It's not one of those games where you really have to pick a lane. Like you want to try to find synergies with your animals. That's important. And and oftentimes you can you know do a lot to like dig through the deck or get to a situation where you can grab the and use those cards off the middle that are that are face up. Uh, but other than that, like you can pretty much fill your zoo, accomplish a number of the conservation goals, have a big tableau of animals and move up on a bunch of tracks and trigger a bunch of rewards every single game. Like you can do a lot of everything the game has to offer each time. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like games think- usually force you into situations where you're going to have to make more trade-offs in terms of broad strategy. Yeah. The part where it kind of does that is in which cards or which actions you choose to upgrade because that gates like yes. the second half of all of those tracks, you kind of have to decide which three or four of these am I going to upgrade and in what order? That's um, true. Yeah, that is a pretty strong gating thing. But if you you have five actions and you get to upgrade at least three of them um, as long as you're reasonably progressing. So that's not, it's not that restrictive, but you do have some decisions there. Yeah, so I, I do see why people are reacting so positively to it. And I think it's because it has a really nice first play experience because you feel accomplished like i both times i play that's kind of the word that's come to mind is like i feel like i've accomplished so many things yeah i built a zoo i filled in the entire plot um i got a bunch of animals i played some awards i i had animals from like every continent or every type of animal i filled up a petting zoo i mean i did a lot of things Mm mm-hmm my concern is that that doesn't make for a good long-term experience, right? And I don't know if that's necessarily the case. And of course, I've only played it twice, so I don't know how it's going to play out if you play it 10, 15, 20 times. And I don't know if it's going to start feeling samey or like too simple or too dependent on the luck of the draw to find like killer combos. 
or if that's even the experience they're looking for. Maybe it's just a game that you go like a casual heavy game almost where you're not like grinding up against the other players or grinding up against really hard puzzles or trade-offs or you know, complex decisions. It, it is a heavy game, but maybe that's the experience they want is it's just kind of a casual vibe. And I guess that's fine. Like, I guess there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. It just seems a little bit, it's not something you commonly see with a, a game that heavy. I wouldn't think it would become the most competitive grind out every possible point because so much of it is adapting to the cards and you're only going to see what at most half the deck or probably less. I think we saw like a third in a three player game. <laughs> that yeah. deck was still really tall at the end. I don't know with that, that level of exposure or percentage exposure to the cards. I don't think you can, reliably go in with a plan of i'm going to go for this strategy i think it's more just going to be a tactical thing of oh yeah this looks cool and i'm going to do this and um and maybe you know, you know if you know what's possible you weight some things higher than others but i think it's very much a tactical game not a strategic game for sure yeah it also forms this kind of triptych with wingspan and terraforming mars as these medium to heavy euro ish games that all feature giant decks of wholly unique cards, which I don't know what to make of that as like, you know, now three of the most successful popular games of the last five years all have these giant decks of cards that are all different. As far as I'm aware, I think in all the games that all the cards are different, which I guess I understand that's really cool. And you're constantly discovering things and seeing new things and you get this sense that uh, of discovery, I guess, and so you mm -hmm. don't, it, it kind of extends that time, that like early play time of like literally discovering what the game has to offer, but also lengthens the time, I think, until you can start really thinking about the game in granular, really strategic terms, because there's just more material in the game. And I kind of like that. I kind because I enjoyed the discovery experience of games. So like extending that time frame in which you're still discovering things on one hand appeals to how I largely enjoy games. On the other hand, again, I feel like, I don't know, as long as that doesn't push out games that are very like mastery focused from the market, like as long as this doesn't become like an overwhelming zeitgeist, I think it's cool that there's kind of both extremes here. Yeah, I don't. I think I'm always going to also want to play more directly competitive games instead of kind of who can accumulate the most things fastest in their own play area. But it was, it was a good experience. I mean, it was a fun game for sure. Yeah. Let's shift over to a prototype I got to demo on Thursday that I believe is currently up on GameFound for uh to try to get crowd crowdfunding money and i want to give it a shout out because i think it was compelling and definitely sits on the uh more granular side of things the game's called space lion by chris solis and i think you would really like this one orion it's loosely inspired by rts's like uh like starcraft insofar as it, sh it pushes people into specific lanes of combat. So there are three lanes for any given person. There's the lane between you and your neighbor on either side, and then there's a lane towards the middle, which is a free-for-all. And everyone essentially has these walls in each of those lanes that have two hit points. Uh, and then once someone gets through the wall to attack you directly, you have three total hit points at your base. And each player only has a hand of seven or eight cards, I believe, that all do different things because each of the factions are unique. Uh, and it's kind of, it's a sci-fi thing. I play it as this robot AI faction. Chris, I think, was playing the humans, you know, uh, mostly harmless. <laughs> Although he did win the game. And then the person to my left was playing this kind of mystical magic adjacent thing they had this portal called the door uh and you did not want them to open the door that was bad was it the trope of humans being the average flexible race 
Uh, I Jack think it was. Uh, I didn't look too much at the theming of hum of the humans. They had a lot of counters. I think it was the more humans as wily and in uh, resourceful. Okay. So, like one of the most important human cards was that it was like their one strength card, but it it blanked any five plus strength card, um, and he was able mm-hmm. to use that really, really effectively. So there was there were little tricks like that. Uh, the humans also were able to put out like additional soldier tokens out, which you know was a thing. The AI faction I was playing, the robots were kind of a titan, had a a titan theme to it. So I would I had my own little economic system where I was getting these resources that I used to pay to activate abilities, and one of those abilities was gathering this other resource, which made my titan card more stronger and. It was, you know, by the halfway point in the game, I got the Titan card. By focusing just a little bit on it, I was able to get the Titan card up to where it was, the, by raw strength numbers, the most powerful card in the game. So that was kind of their thing. Uh, the, the, the other faction that was in play, basically, with, when the door was closed, they had underpowered abilities. When the door was open, they unlocked secondary effects of those abilities, and they beca- they were overpowered. So it was like the cards could either be on one side or the other side of the power curve, but they had to they had to invest and trigger certain effects to get the door to open, um, which was it was cool. Yeah, and and it's it's a Yomi game, right? So you're playing cards to the to the different lanes face down, and then you flip them face up and reveal them. There's an initiative thing where the person with initiative gets to determine in what order they play the the cards play in, um, which can be beneficial to you know making sure certain effects trigger before other effects, and you're just trying to win these individual combats. And if you won a given conflict in a given lane, you did a point worth of damage to the barrier or to the person. And it was just a, a fight for um, fight to defeat the other players, you know, free for all kind of thing. Uh, last man standing. Uh, but mm-hmm. because, you know, each side only has eight cards, you know, the possibility space, even on, you know, halfway two thirds of the way through the first game, you start to understand the possibility space and how the cards interact with each other. So it kind of felt like inish in that way uh, where you, you know, you don't know precisely what's being played, but you kind of, even in the first place, start to understand kind of the feeling of what what powers people have or what they could pull out, and you start to work within those parameters. And then, of course, in the long term, you know precisely what all the cards do, and then you can really get into the mind games. So uh, mm-hmm. I want to give that a shout out. I think it has a lot of potential uh, for sure. Uh, and it's always exciting when I play a prototype game that has potential. So shout out to them. Cool. Go find it on GameFound Space Lion. I forgot. We usually in these PAX casts start uh, with talking about the non-board game stuff. I know you wandered around and saw some video game stuff. Anything stand out to you? Let me grab. I made note of a few things. Yeah, that was smarter than me. I mentally made note of a few things and then promptly forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, see, I've learned that I will not remember that sort of stuff unless I write it down. So I wrote it down this year. Yeah. Well, um, I, I also, as I wandered the halls and saw stuff, I'm like, oh, that looks pretty cool. And then would always immediately think of how many unplayed games I have in my Steam library that also <laughs> looked pretty cool. And I'm like, yeah, mm, doesn't look that cool. <laughs> yeah. In the big, in the arena, they had this game that was like, Unreal Tournament or Overwatch or something like that, but it had the portal gun from Portal. Oh. And then there were all these surfaces that you could create portals. So a lot of, apparently there's, it's a multiplayer shooter arena game, but it's all about going through these portals and navigating and blocking portals and timing things and stuff like that. So it's not really my style of game, but it looked really cool. I think I saw Um, a video on that once. Because I think it came okay. out a few months ago, or at least it like opened in alpha a few months ago. Uh, okay, I think it's, it was called cool. Splitgate. Yeah, yeah, I watched a video about that. It looked cool, and yeah, definitely not, definitely not my kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to enjoy the less twitchy shooters. I do like multiplayer shooters quite a bit, but I I don't have the twitch skills as much. Mm-hmm. Overwatch was a nice like middle ground for me. 
or Team Fortress yeah. 2 um, back in the day. That was good stuff. There was a game called Cyber Knights Flashpoint, which said it was a cyberpunk heist RPG, which those are all words that I like. So that sounded cool. That is a good list of um, adjectives. <laughs> There was a game called Phantom Brigade, which was a turn-based mech tactics game. I which, saw that one, yeah. Um, that one looked pretty cool. There was a puzzle game called Way of Rhea, or R R H E A Ray, maybe. I that one stood out to me. I forget why now. And then there's a bunch of I saw a lot of uh, like two D cartoon, cartoony either or or cartoony graphics which which were either like action adventure games or scrollers. I saw a lot of those. Wandered through the more indie game section and it was a, you know a bunch of little little games that don't have the the scope of some they're not going to build a giant 3D rendering engine <laughs> to make their game and spend 100, you know, put 100 programmers on something. Um Right. But there, there's cool stuff in there. So yeah, there's some fun stuff. It was definitely a lot smaller than in the past. Oh yeah. And I noticed that pretty much none of the big publishers were there, uh, which was a difference from the last time I went to PAX East a couple years ago. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I talked to someone about that, and they said that basically all the big companies like Sony, Microsoft, or actually no, was Microsoft there? Sony, mm-hmm. Nintendo. I forgot the other name they mentioned, uh, who are usually there simply couldn't commit early enough because of uncertainty around international travel laws. So they kind of just didn't do it. And so what, what you ended up seeing was that the biggest booths were mostly hardware companies. So yep. Intel had this huge booth. It was like the size of three large booths strung together just for Intel which I'd never seen something like that before. Intel was mostly, they just had a bunch of computers set up for, I think, free play huh. for people. And I guess they're just trying to say, look how cool, look how great our you know hardware is. You should buy it. Yeah, at that point, it's just like brand recognition, like just remembering. I mean, although if you're into PC but, gaming, you obviously know that Intel exists. Yeah. Um, I'm not a marketing person, so. Yeah. Yeah, there were a couple of booths. The thing I saw, so in previous PAXs, I always try to get a, a scope of like what the zeitgeist is in terms of genre in gaming. And for a couple PAXs, it was always these 2D retro graphic platformer games. Like I'd see so many of them. They were all over the place. This year, I saw far fewer of those. And at least based on my observations, the zeitgeist has shifted towards... 3D third person action adventure. I think, you know, souls like games or at least inspired, uh, you mm-hmm. know, for the 3D stuff. Cause you know, that's the biggest game genre at the moment for like the AAA stuff. And then I saw a bunch of tactical turn-based games. So I saw that mech one you talked about and I saw at least two or three others, which I thought was cool. Cause I typically like that style of game. So it seemed like a high ratio of turn-based tactical, like grid-based games, or maybe not grid-based necessarily, but you know, turn-based tactics games, which I feel like haven't had a kind of a big. I feel like early 3D, like PlayStation Two era, there were a number of mi- these like military sim games that were turn-based tactics stuff, and then it kind of went out of favor. I guess there was that indie game, um, Into the Breach, uh, which I which got a lot of recognition a few years ago, but. I don't know. That was my observation. Oh, yeah. That I never more, played that one. They're more turn-based stuff. Into the Breach is hard. It is really hard. I started playing it because I always want to try to find games that meet the very specific criteria necessary to be able to play them while I'm editing the podcast, uh, which is I can turn the sound off and it doesn't ruin anything. I can stop playing at any time. It's got to be effectively, it's got to be turn-based um, or very easy to pause. And I don't have to think too much because I have to simultaneously listen to the podcast and know when to edit stuff and, and what, what can improve it. Improve it. So I, I picked up that one and I started playing it because it seemed to meet the criteria, but it was actually too difficult. <laughs> I, I hardly ever got past like the opening stage because you really, really. <laughs> you really have to plan out your turns really well so so far you know slay the spire has been mvp on that because you know 
I don't play it well, but yeah, I, I, I can play Slay the Spire well enough while I'm editing, uh, and then my sports games like golf and such. But that one did not meet the cut. I tried and I uh, got too frustrating. Uh, but it's very good if you dedicate some brain power to it. I also noticed so many booths had merch. Like everyone had a t-shirt and a sticker and a little bag or a cup or a magnet or a whatever. Like every so many booths had merch, which huh. I didn't remember that being a thing as much in the past. Yeah, I didn't know, notice that specifically, but I, I, thinking back, I see what you mean. I don't know what would cause that. I don't know if that's like... I a, mean, some of it's maybe is just... I know there's a lot of... I think it's easier to like spin up a, your own little t-shirt or uh, store now. Um, mm-hmm. There's companies that specifically sponsor that sort of storefront and make it easy to do that. Um, Speaking and of I know which, uh, the Thoughtful Gamer has t-shirts available with the thoughtful gamer logo on them on Redbubble. <laughs> so there you go continue plug. <laughs> gotta get the plug in i know a lot of streamers will basically spin up a you know a store with some merch or some or something like that and that seems to be becoming more common of the it's 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 this move towards personal branding i think and the it's one kind of outlet of that is physical merch yeah, personal branding's been around a long time. I wonder if it's it could be on both ends. Right? It could be it could be that uh, the the cost to professionalize that and actually get products out at a reasonable rate without a huge markup um or 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 very without high costs for low quantities or print on demand kind of stuff m- might be cheaper now. Um but also it could be like a perception that that that's a reasonable way to get a small amount of revenue has shifted. I don't know. That's, that's an interesting observation. There was, there was a video game that someone recommended to me and I, I never went back and found it, but apparently it, it's, it's essentially a board game, but digital, like it's not, it's not like a digital version of the board game, but it is a digital game that has the, that, that like could be a board game. I don't know what, what to call that. Okay. Anyways, uh, I don't remember the name. It had the word dice in it, and it it was a civ building or city building game with dice, and apparently it's really, really good. So anyone <laughs> listening out there wants to hunt down the game based on that vague description, it was recommended to me. <laughs> yes, let us know in the comments or something. Yeah, and tell me what it is so I can go back and find it. Uh, let's talk about the first game we played on Friday, Zapotec. The worst game we played on Friday. Uh, yeah, that's true, actually. <laughs> Not to throw shade. It was fun, but it was um, all right. It had some, well, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a game from, was it Lopia, wasn't, wasn't that- Lopiano? Uh, so okay. we played a lot of games or at least I played a lot of games that weekend from what I think is known as the Italians, uh, that group of like five Italian designers uh, that all produce these like mid to heavy Euro games. You know, so there's the series, the T series with Zulkin and Teotihuacan. And then I think there was a third one in the series. Now you got Zapotec. Uh, we're going to talk about Golem later. Anyways, Zapotec was weird. So it kind of had old school vibes in so far as it wasn't as complex as many of the games coming from this group. It was solidly mid-weight um, and no more than that. And it was very symmetrical. It's very symmetrical. It was kind of component minimal. Um, it wasn't trying to be this extravagant production. And it had some interesting ideas in in so far as you were kind of investing in building up this three by three grid on your player board with these resource tokens. And then on your turn, you would activate one of the rows or columns of that grid to get resources for your turn. Um, It's the same idea, the same designer used in Merv. And I think it was far, far more successful in Merv than in Zapotec. And I think other than our big complaint, which we'll get to in a moment, 
I think the game was decent. I think it had some cool interactions, some fun stuff, but nothing that really stood out. I liked the kind of old school, minimal, more minimal production, you know, compared to something like Ark Nova, which is this kind of feast on the table. You know, it was, you know, it looked like a power grid or uh, even Zulkin, going back to that same group of designers, right? It's Or Teo Tewakan. <laughs> that one was... That one, had the, that one had the pyramid. The whole pyramid and, and everything. That, that yeah. one got a little bit more fancy with it. But, you know, it... If if someone told me that the game was made in two thousand three, I'd be like, yeah, it looks like a game from two thousand three. That's all I'm saying, uh, which is fine, and I like that because uh, maybe you know maybe we would need some less crazy blinged out extravagant euros. It's nice to have something a little more modest. However, our big complaint really brought that game to kind of a screeching halt. I'll let you take over that one. Uh, yeah, so the way the game works is that on your turn, you have a number of actions that are kind of grouped. And so you first you do, I think they're called the power actions, and then you build buildings, and then you collect income, and then you uh, reset your, redraw your hand of cards. And uh, the problem is that you determine, you kind of simultaneously reveal cards at the beginning, and that determines your initiative for the turn. But each person takes their entire action before the next person takes their, or I should say their entire turn. And then the next player takes their entire turn and we played with three. So then the third player takes their entire turn. And the first it's played in five rounds and the first two rounds, this was fine because you built one or two things and there was, you know, few decisions to make, but by the end of the game, planning out and working out your turn and sequencing everything took like 10 minutes. So there was a lot of downtime when, especially, you know, we revealed cards. I have the highest number. I'm like, I could go take a walk for 15 minutes and come back because there's nothing going on. There's nothing for me to do. And there's no player interaction otherwise. And that really just, it really broke the pace of the game and the engagement because I'm like, well, I guess I can collect my resources and kind of start planning what I want to do, but I have so much downtime and they might take a space that I want. So, yeah. And you could get stuck in a situation where you were the first person to go in the previous round. And now you're the last person to go in this next round. And even taking, even being friendly to the game, I just did a little bit of the math. Let's say, let's say the game took the, the shortest, amount of time on the box estimate which is an hour and you're playing with three players that averages to four minutes a turn because you only have four turns or excuse me five turns so even if you're going relatively quick according to the box estimate which we all know box estimates are you know for usually they're determined by people who have played and know the game very well even also, the time is skewed towards the first turns are very quick yeah. and the last turns are much longer. Yeah, on average four minutes. But your first turn, you're basically doing one thing. That's all you can do. And your second turn, you're kind of doing like two to three things. So that time is super, super backloaded into the third, fourth, and fifth rounds. And so, yeah, I mean, there was a situation, I think, where you got you were in that spot where you went, you had gone first and now you're going last in round four, maybe. And it mm-hmm. was probably easily 15 minutes between your turns, if not 20. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessary in that game. I don't think you had to do that. I think without much disruption, you could create a round structure that breaks it up and lets people do things, you know, fewer things in a shorter amount of time. I actually just wrote an article about this where I actually. Did I actually write that article or did I conceptualize it and haven't yet written it? Let me look that up. <laughs> You've theoretically written an article about this coming soon. There's an soon. article that has been written or will be written in the future. Oh, yeah. I called it downtime isn't a four-letter word. I wrote it uh, about three weeks ago. And in that, I talked about how I think games were going too far in dividing terms up, turns up into little tiny segments Instead, uh, to try to reduce downtime, but that's a problem. Zapotec is way on the other side. 
Like I pointed yeah, in, out in huge contrast, we played this and then we played Arc Nova, which is you take a very small turn, but you accomplish something every time in Arc Nova. And this was yeah. you take a huge turn and have to plan out a whole bunch of stuff and wait for everyone else to do their turn. Yeah. And my argument in the downtime article is that the way the game is structured should fit mechanically. So so it's going to be natural for some games to have longer turns in some games to have shorter term turns, but you should, you shouldn't feel like you're only thinking like every third turn. So Arc Nova does short turns really well because each turn you're making a genuine decision and you're getting something done. You're getting feedback from it. Whereas a game like Scythe, I think would have been better with longer turns because in Scythe, what effectively happens is you line up, you you think about what you want to do, and you you mentally line up like your next five actions. And then you're kind of on autopilot for those five actions. And that's what I think you want to try to avoid. I think Zapotec certainly doesn't do that, but I think it could have been broken up a bit more and still maintain that system where each turn you're making a genuine decision and each turn you're getting some kind of feedback from the game. Um, and I think that would have improved Zapotec. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they tried that and this was the only solution, but it did not help the game. It made the game grind down uh, quite a bit. Yep. And what, what did it, it took us maybe an hour and a half? That I we bet had it to took us 90 minutes. Reread yeah. the rules and set up and stuff. Yeah. Where there's a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I want to give a shout out real quick to this dumb party game I played. Dumb in, in the good way, actually. While you were walking through and actually taking notes on video games, it was called Pavlov's Dogs. I, I just saw a random demo. I didn't even know what the game was. And I said, hey, are you demoing a game? And he's like, yeah. And we got a couple of other people. It was a party game. Uh, I'm going to say it's in the Bunny Bunny Moose Moose Continuum. Uh, insofar as it is a game about a party game about trying to successfully navigate a series of dumb arbitrary tasks <laughs> uh, while the game is trying to actively confuse you about the nature of those tasks it was kind of cool i'm pretty hard on party games this one i think works pretty well how it works is obviously it's based on Pavlov and it has this dog theme, you know, about conditioning and you're dealt a hand of not a hand, but you're dealt like five cards, I think face down in front of you. So you don't see them. And on each card, there's a number, I think between one and or zero and five and it has a word that's associated with dog training. So roll or speak or shake, you know, different things like that. And, the starting point is that you flip over a card and you simply add the number to the previous sum and you exclaim what that number is. So if all the previous cards had added up to 10 and you flip over a three, you now say 13. But each round, a new condition gets applied to it and you get to know what that condition is, but then you cannot, during the round, you don't see what the condition is. So you have to remember it. And the conditions that I played with they would do things like you had to perform some additional action when there was a certain word. So, for instance, I believe in my game when it said, I forget, when it said sit, maybe you had to bark. Or it would change what the numbers were. So, in my game, for instance, about halfway through, a new rule came up where every card that said roll was a one no matter what the actual number was printed on the card. So by the end, if we were playing on like a medium difficulty, I think we had six different rules we had to remember uh, as we were playing these cards. And then, you know, you have a certain number of mistakes you can make before you abysmally fail. We did not completely fail, but we failed enough that we did not meet the uh, criteria for a score. <laughs> So it's kind of like a better implementation of Mao. Oh yeah, kinda. Yeah, with like just arbitrary rules. Yeah. Arbitrary rules, but the game imposes them, not someone thinks them up and then makes fun of everyone who doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. Or, or again, like Bunny Bunny Moose Moose, right? It's you're doing something that should be very, very simple and trivial, but the game is actively trying to confuse you. 
Uh, so yeah, I thought it was cool. Uh, again, it's, I probably won't buy a copy, but if someone brought it out at a party, I'd play it. What was the next game we played? Was it Radlands? Radlands. Yeah. yeah Radlands. Uh, this is one I definitely want to play more. So I saw a taste. I, I know a lot of people really enjoyed this game and I can see where it has potential. Uh, but it's definitely one I don't feel like I got a, a really complete understanding of just in our one play, but I got a, I got a taste and I, and I think it's cool. So it's a two player card game. You got a deck of cards. It's again, like space light and it's got this lane system, uh, where you have these base three base cards and they, they create these lanes and you play people cards in front of them. They're various fighters. It's got this kind of, it's not cyberpunk. What, what would the aesthetic be? It's, it's like Mad Max, it's like Mad Max Borderlands, kind of. Yeah, they're like apocalyptic punk. There's got to be a yeah, like a wa- wasteland, a wasteland punk, punk or wasteland punk or something yeah. like that. I feel like there's got to be a name. There's got to be like an official name. What does it say? I'm looking at the board game group. It just says post-apocalyptic. All right. Anyways, it's got that aesthetic to it. Yeah, like Mad Max or, or Borderlands. And you're playing these fighters, and they have abilities, and you're trying to you know, defend and attack and, and synchronize or, or synergize abilities and all that good stuff. But it was actually like crunchy in terms of decision making. So I feel like in a lot of games where you, you know, you have this random deck of cards and you're just trying to attack, it ends up being that the interactions that you can generate, the synergies that you can discover are just kind of right there in front of you. I think this one had a lot of really interesting decisions in terms of when you played cards, where you played them, in what order you played them, because it was actually difficult to keep cards alive and you needed to keep them alive in order to activate their abilities. So I, I think I do think it has a lot of potential for to be a really nice two player game. You could also play each card in at least two different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. So you always had options of how do I want to use this? Do I throw it away for the quick, you know, plus one water or, or, you know, a simple action, or do I play it and hope to actually activate its ability? Or maybe I just want another body on the field. Yeah. And then also I know a couple of times I had to really pay attention to what you were threatening because you, you were threatening a board wipe and I had to be able to respond to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. The, the, the game didn't shy away from really, really powerful attacks. Mm-hmm. And obviously, those I can mean, be fragile in different ways. But I think a worse game would be scared of like a card that c- could wipe the board, right? Just being one of the cards. Yeah, I think you had an event that basically every card has two health, so you tap it, and then if it takes another damage, it's destroyed. Um, and you had you played one event that tapped or damaged all every card on my board and then you had a character that if you had been able to activate would have destroyed every damaged um, yeah. card and i saw that i was like oh wow um the saving grace is that that event you queue it up and it takes a couple turns to activate so the more powerful ones take longer to activate you can see them coming and kind of plan for it and so i was able to play a card that healed a card and then that one let me heal everything else so I was able to nullify that at the right time and plan for that. But yeah, like if I didn't have that or something very similar to that, I would have just been destroyed. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's to the game's benefit that it allows for those situations. And obviously it's a short game, which gives it more mm-hmm. leeway to have those, you know, once every 20 games where someone just gets exactly the right cards and is able to wipe someone out, you know, a short game can can do that, which means a short game can create more dramatic situations like that in these really big, powerful effects and in stuff. So I think that's a, that's a smart design decision. Yeah, it was yeah. fun. For sure. I would definitely like to explore it more. Speaking of excellent card games, we went to the Netrunner, the Nisei meetup, uh, which was cool. The room was full of people playing Netrunner. Yeah, it was that's great. the first time I've been in a room of people playing Netrunner in like three years. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. 
Like the room was full. Like it was every single spot was taken. And I think it was more than they expected than the Nisei people expected. And they were so excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were running around giving people three free promo cards and you know There's a bunch of new people too who had never yeah, played. So they I would were say teaching. Eighty like percent of people. the games were teaching games that were going on. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's probably true. Because that one table in the corner and then the other one and the front desk were all teaching games. I think there was the group right next to us because we were on a big table, so there were two games going on at that table. They were they knew what was happening, and then maybe one other game, like one other pairing was like experienced people. I think every other game was a teaching game, um, yeah. which was fantastic. And Nisei is really getting momentum. I know that uh, one of the Penny Arcade people who put on packs – uh, got a demo of Netrunner and tweeted about it. And I and literally the tweet said, this is the most exciting thing happening in gaming right now. <laughs> wow. High praise. Um, yeah. I saw on a Discord channel for Nisei that w- someone mentioned that there's going to be a Shut Up and Sit Down video. Shut Up and Sit Down was into Netrunner really early. Um, yeah, Quinn's loved it. Yeah, he he won a pretty big tournament. I think didn't he win like the London qualifier to the national championship or the world's championship or something? Maybe. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, they were really early uh, enthusiasts for Netrunner, and so see, seems like they got another video coming out. So yeah, Nisei is finally getting really good momentum. You know, it's it's hard with the pandemic, right? Because Netrunner or any game like this really thrives on in-person games and having meetups and actually, you know, building a community, uh, which is difficult to do when it's all online. So, you know, I think they're capitalizing just at the right time. They got the new cycle, which should be out, I don't know, within the next few months, I would assume. And after that, it's only, what, two or three more cycles before standard is all Nisei cards. And at that point, that'll be really interesting. Um, yeah, I think there are two cycles of the FFG cards and one big, one or two big boxes that are still in. Or no, maybe three, three like of the lagging. big boxes. There's like one, adi- one more big box than there are cycles. Yeah, two cycles and three big boxes, I think. Uh, yeah, and, you know, and it's their goal to eventually just completely divorce from the Fantasy Flight stuff, which is, you know, good uh, for legal reasons, although they seem to be pretty safe legally. And then it become the game becomes Nisei, right? It's mm-hmm. <laughs> it becomes their right. own thing, which is a really cool thing to build off of. And I'm I'm excited to see how big it can get, because um, I would love for there to be active, you know, local scenes. And you know, in the heyday, I I, I I assume in most, if not all, major cities in America, in many many cities around the world, there was an active netrunner scene. Um, so I would love to see that back in action and they're certainly heading in that direction. Yeah. And for anyone in Boston, I think, uh, Panda is getting that going again. So, yeah. So there was actually, we're recording this on the, on April 29th yesterday, there was a meetup in boss or in Somerville. And then I think they're going to try to start meeting up at pandemonium in Cambridge starting next week. And I'm going to try to make it. Apparently, Pandemonium had did a whole bunch of renovations, so I don't know what it's even going to look like there anymore. I watched the last couple rounds of the Worlds tournament from last November. Um, that was cool, and uh, I've been trying to deck build again, and I sorted out all my cards from Mark's house that are still legal and managed to fit those in my bag to come back, coming back. So I have half of a set here <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta or get a third the, of a set you gotta or get the new stuff yeah i gotta get the new stuff or proxy a whole bunch but um yeah they have loose rules they have um permissive rules around that so around proxy it makes yeah. it easy it makes it easy to get into it which is good one benefit if nisei keeps growing right and we gets a lot of attention is that they might be able to shift to actual production instead of print on demand which will lower the price of their sets pretty significantly i think they might actually mm-hmm. be able to do like real print runs. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because um, the price is more expensive than when it was uh, with with Fantasy Flight. Uh, but in my mind, worth it. 
One game that I played on Thursday is Boon Lake, which is the new game from Alexander Pfister, creator of Great Western Trail, among others. What other games has he done? That's his big one. He's got a really good list of games he's created. Oh, Mombasa. I played that one. Isle of Sky. I've played that one. Maricabo. Played that one once. Uh, yeah, he's made a lot of really good games. Boon Lake. Remind- I'm told it also has cows in it. Yeah, Boon Lake reminds me a lot of Great Western Trail, but more more loose, I guess is the word, where Great Western Trail, at least in my third or fourth games, I started to really tighten up in terms of player interaction and trying to like punish players for going down certain routes and you know interacting with the board in that way where you create favorable conditions for yourself for traveling that trail. Boon Lake is a lot more, lot more, lot friendlier. I think with the player interaction, it's a little bit more complex, and so it fits more into that, like, you know, like we talked about with with Zapotec or Ark Nova, that more multiplayer solitaire, puzzly style, more on towards the Lacerda sort of things. I think rather than Great Western Trail, which has a fair amount of interaction. But there are cows in both, and I planted many cows in many fields. And by many, I mean three, but that was a decent number. And I think it's a fun puzzle. I just, man, I'm I, as I'm playing it, I'm like, I kind of would rather play Great Western Trail here. I think there's just more interesting stuff. I don't know what I got out of Boon Lake that I wouldn't get out of Great Western Trail, plus an, an, a healthier dose of interaction in a slightly simpler game. But maybe I would, maybe my thoughts of it would improve over time because I did feel like all of us playing did relatively poorly at kind of solving that mechanical puzzle. Like there was, there was end game stuff, you know, that those kinds of like big rewards that you try to build up to, to cash in right at the end of the game uh, that we did not access. So that indicates to me that we didn't play particularly efficiently. It has this a nice tableau thing where you're building out tableau cards for on your tableau, but it's also got a lot of building on the board where you're doing kind of a Terra Mystica thing where you, you place one thing and then you can upgrade into another thing and upgrade into a third thing and get different levels of income. Uh, it's got a it's got a little bit of everything there. It's got the cards, it's got the board stuff, it's got a uh, technology thing where it gives you like once per round powers. It's not a bad game at all. I greatly enjoyed it. It just didn't feel quite as cohesive as all of the games that clearly influenced it that are great. Right. So what do you do with that when you have? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that in terms of evaluation when. You know, it's a really solid, it was a fun two and a, two and a half hours, but it constantly make me think, I wish I was playing this other better game that clearly inspired it. So there's my, there's my review. <laughs> this is my evaluation of, based on one play. But if someone, you know, someone really you know got a copy, someone in, in the, in the game group here bought a copy and is like, I really want to play Boon Lake and figure it out. I would totally be down for that. Anyways. That's Boon Lake. I don't know why. Onto the funniest game of the weekend. (laughs) I just realized I have no clue why it's called Boon Lake. Is it? It's just kind of a. It's just kind of a mythical Lake Boon. Is it the shores of Boon Lake, a long forgotten region inhabited by humans long ago? I'm looking at the description here. It's just kind of a vague settling thing. Yeah, that's not super exciting. I thought. Based on, like, the font choice, like, looking at the cover, I thought there was going to be, like, ecological themes to it. And it's called Boon Lake, as if the lake is foreboding. But, no, you're just, like, it's just, like, Terra Mystica, Great Western Trail, like, just going along and, and building up an area, kind of vague settlement stuff. So, anyways, let's end here with... I think both of our favorite game, other than Netrunner, Netrunner always wins, uh, but favorite new game, we'll say that of the weekend. Is this your favorite? Was this your favorite of the day? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is Golem. Again, from that Italian group of designers, this time from Brassini 
Gigli? I, I, I don't know how to pronounce that name. Uh, and Luciani. Luciani, I know I've heard before. I think he's the one who did to Zulkin. Yes, he did Zulkin um, in a bunch of other games. Golem was really, really fascinating. And not because it did anything necessarily exciting, but it did, I think, a lot of things very subtly well. And also, it's kind of funny. So the biggest downside of Gollum was that the rule book was very, very difficult to parse. It was bad. And the setup was intense. The rule book compounded was really by the fact bad. that the rule book was bad. Um, maybe it's a translation thing, or maybe it just needs an editing pass. I don't know. But that aside, the game was great. Once we figured it out, yeah. So the 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 the, the a, all the actions in the game are kind of split up into three different color pies. So you've got blue, which is your knowledge and cards and that those are the knowledge and cards basically you've got your red color which is your golems and you've got your yellow color which is money and these artifacts that you construct with gold ingots and you you want to focus on them because it's this multiplicative scoring where you take for example the number of golems you built times the number of red menorahs that you scored and that's your score for the red category um so you want to you want to max out a category, but to get the income you need, you kind of have to do everything. So there's this, there's a tension there. And then in some of the, even inside some of the colors, there's this tension of, for example, in blue, you get points for going wide and putting a card in each one of these four different columns, but you get more income by stacking cards in one column, because every time you put a new card there, you get all of the income for that entire column. Again, so, you you know, taking a fourth blue card gives you a whole bunch of resources, but not victory points. And then the, the funniest part of the game is that the, the theming is that you have your graduate assistant students walking down one side of the street. And then on the other side of the street, you have your golems, which would just tear off and tear down and just start running down the street. And you could stop them or slow them down. So you were you had to you were rushing to try to keep up with them. You keep your students, you know, keep up with them on one, on the one side, and they're just you know forging ahead until you finally killed the golem and put it in the graveyard. There are <laughs> some new, you, there are some things you, you can one. do to pull the golems back. Some yeah, th- there are there's there are actions to move them back, but um, you cannot prevent them from running forward <laughs> at a. At an oh, yeah. ever increasing pace as they you just, build more they just calls. sprint away. They just run yeah. away. <laughs> but the cool thing is, and this is indicative or this is emblematic of so many of the game systems, is that yeah, these golems are running away and it's really annoying because you get penalized heavily if they're too far ahead of you. But the further they go, the better actions they have access to if you play the golem action, which gives you whatever bonus is associated with the spaces they're on. So you simultaneously do and do not want them to run really far ahead. Yeah. And and that kind of thing exists all over the place in this game, like going wide versus going tall with the books, figuring out if you want to go like invest in really long-term stuff or short-term stuff with the artifacts and just how all three colors interact with each other. You're constantly faced with these really subtle, really cool trade-offs all over the place in like every decision in the game. And we didn't even mention the action selection, which is the best randomizer tree thing that we've probably seen, right? It's pretty cool. It's it's like a dice tower, except it's with marbles and they, you know, they randomly come out in one of these five different tracks, which determines which action you can take by selecting that marble. And so the color of the marble determines which of your assistants you move, which track you move your assistants on. And the number of marbles in that column is how powerful that action is. So maybe you really want to move your blue assistant, but the only blue marbles are in are by themselves or with one other marble, and you really need to take a gold action. And so then you decide to take a different color marble to get that five power action, or you decide, no, blue is more important to me. And, uh, and you take the less powerful action. Yeah. It's really a modification on the cube tower system that games like Amerigo, uh, have, uh, that's the which, word I was thinking of cube tower. Yeah. Which really fell out of style. Cube tower is weird. It wasn't as variable as I wanted. You kind of, I don't remember exactly, but there was like, 
every time you dump cubes in, like a certain like the ratio of cubes that escaped the tower was more or less the same every time. But it was interesting. Uh, I, I I like this marble thing better, even though like the cube tower is potentially more interesting because it's all about how many cubes get stuck in the architecture of the tower and how many escape out. The marble thing is only about how they're distributed because all of them are getting through. It's just a matter of which ones are where. Uh, but both are cool. The setting and theme of this game, I don't know what to think of it. Like It's a very strange setting <laughs> to take a game, to take this, this like Jewish mythology and then make a heavy Euro game about it is weird. But it kind of works, I think. I don't know. Like, neither of us are Jewish. And I don't really know that much about the Golem stories. I know there's a, a legend about a rabbi. And I think that's prim the primary source of information for this game. About a rabbi who made a Golem, which is this kind of beast made of clay. automaton yeah automaton yeah. made of clay um and like it's inscribed with uh words on its forehead or i looked in wikipedia and maybe other places like so i think in one of the stories it's like literally in the, in its mouth uh and the words give it life obviously echoing the creation myth where god speaks life into existence and then in that story i think it like defends uh the local jewish community from uh, people who would attack them. But I, according to Wikipedia, at least in other stories, the golems are actually this kind of hubris cautionary tale where they make the golems and the golems actually cause trouble. Uh, and then they have to rush to try to kill the golems before they cause too much chaos. There's other stories where the, the, it emphasizes that the golems are just these like work creatures and they're dumb and they just kind of do whatever you tell them to do until forever, until they you you kill them so there's i knew of the defense version of the story just from i don't know where just you know sometime in my life i had heard that but it was interesting wiki reading the wikipedia article about how varied the golem stories are like they take on all kinds of different themes and ideas uh centered around this the central idea of what a golem is like it's just this creature made of earth and given life which is interesting and so the game doesn't do anything with the defense there's no like enemies attacking but it does a lot with the idea that the golems are like hard to contain um with the, of course the running away uh which i find greatly amusing and i found it more and more amusing the more i played that you're just creating these beans and then they immediately sprint away and you start chasing them down the roads <laughs> And then you eventually have to kill them before they cause too much trouble. And then everything else is themed very academically. Like you're gathering books and you're doing science and you're gaining knowledge. Like one of the resources is literally called, called knowledge. And then that's contrasted with the effects of your knowledge, which are these stupid creatures that won't stand still. There's something in there that's worth analyzing, I think, that maybe someone who has more knowledge of the underlying myths and stories uh, could write something really fascinating about how the game interprets them. The the art style was almost like an industrial um, neighborhood or, or workshop or laboratory or something. For sure. Yeah. But I think the, I think the story it's based off of in Prague is pre-industrial. I think it's like Renaissance era. Let me look it up real quick. Okay. Maybe it is. Um, it just, it had like gold spelting going on and it had um, the architecture to me looked like it made me think of industrial London, but maybe if it's, I'm just, maybe I could be wrong. If it's based off of the, the most famous one, which is about the defense of Prague, which I think is what the rule book said it was. It's uh, according to Wikipedia, it's late 16th century. Okay, so I guess that that's within within the realm of kind of what I'd imagine. I was I was thinking later, but it's er I early, see more early science, academic. early science, but pre-industrial. Okay, right, right. Wouldn't that be like early Enlightenment period? Um, yeah, yeah. I tend to think of the Enlightenment of more like late 1600s, 1700s. Yeah, and there's more the Renaissance that's in the, the 1500s. Dates. Oh, that'd be Renaissance. Um, okay. Renaissance, so, but yeah. Okay, pre-enlightenment then. 
<laughs> I'm really bad at dates, like even these broad date ranges. The artifacts and stuff, or was that what they were called? Artifacts, the the gold, the it was yellow. It's called artifacts. Yeah, yeah. They it was vaguely alchemical looking, you know, like early chemistry kind of stuff uh, in the art. Yeah. Okay, so that fits. Anyways, the cool thing about Golem is that, you know, I played for... Didn't we play that game for like four hours or something? Including the rule book? Yeah, probably. No, I think it was probably three to three and a half. I think... Okay. No, I think I looked like active play time was like two and a half, maybe 240. Okay. But there was lots of... Remember, trying to figure out that one rule. <laughs> the rule There book. was a good hour of rule book and... And waiting um, for a fourth player and... And, yeah. and, and that, yeah. But... But... I mean, the theme of PAX East this year to me was these medium to heavy, pretty much heavy Euro games. I, from the I, Italians. <laughs> yeah, from mostly from the Italians. And I do love that style of game. But by the end, I was like, I'm kind of just playing the same game over and over here. And Golem was so refreshing, not because it had like anything, like a, it didn't have a high concept it didn't have anything really new. The marble thing I hadn't seen before, but I think there there have definitely been games with marble tracks like that. I don't know if they implemented them in the same way, but nothing really like super innovative or new, but it felt fresh because the subtleties of how all the different parts interacted were more interesting and made better decision points and made me think about what I wanted to try the next play. Like, it worked on a really subtle level that I wasn't expecting. And I had kind of forgotten about it. I'd forgotten, like, the last time I had played a game that was like that. But I know I have. And so I went in. You know, it was getting late in the evening. And I was thinking, you know, man, we're about to play another Heavy Euro. I'm sure I'm going to like it, but it's probably going to feel the same. And, and the cool thing about Golem is that it didn't. It didn't feel the same as those other games in ways that are difficult to explain. So good on them. Just, you know, hire a rule book editor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please, please. It was so hard to get through that rule book. Oh, man. But yeah, that was our PAX East. I played a couple other games, but not particularly exciting. I finally got to play No Thanks. Uh, which is kind of a classic early millennium card game that I've always heard is fantastic. And I got a two player demo, which your game's not actually supposed to be played with two players, but it was all right with two. But I, I totally see why it's a classic that stuck around for 20 years, maybe. Uh, totally see it. It's a good, solid, easy bidding game. I would definitely play that with a larger group, you know, with the player count that's actually supported. I finally got to play a game of Unmatched, which is kind of the big restoration games hit that they've released a whole bunch of different boxes for, uh, which is like just different fictional characters or historical people, combat, like a little combat arena kind of game. And uh, yeah, I had, I had an all right time with it. I could see maybe getting into it a bit more and, and getting more enjoyment out of it, but I'm not jumping at the bit to do that. Uh, and then a couple other games that aren't weren't interesting enough to talk about. So that was my packs. Yeah, it was a good weekend. We yeah. played disc golf on Saturday. That was really um, fun. I got to play 18xx on Sunday. Yeah. So yeah, good trip. Indeed. And I greatly liked that it was less crowded. <laughs> you know, it's kind of yes, sad to that see, was like, definitely... oh yeah, the pandemic's kind of bringing the convention down. But on the other hand... It wasn't a completely packed madhouse. Uh, yeah. As a personal experience, it was not overwhelming and, you know, headache inducing. And the roar was not present in the way that it has been in the past. For sure. So that was nice. Uh, but and the food trucks were good. Oh, yeah. The, they've really stepped up the food truck game at, at PAX East. For yep. sure. They've got almost they must have all had a of... dozen, 20 outside. Yeah, and they're like the best food trucks in Boston. Yeah. Like other than, I don't know if Tanoke actually does a food truck anymore, but every other food truck that I had like heard of, like people talk about, uh, was there other than, you know, Tanoke, if they still have one. But maybe they've 
gone past that because they now have like three three actual locations. But yeah, good stuff. They got they got the they got the good food trucks there. So I highly recommend PAX East. Like Unplugged is great because it's all entirely dedicated to board games, but East has a big board game presence, uh, which is why I continue to go uh, go to it. And the PAX people put on a great show every single time. They're the, they're great at it. I think that's all we got. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find everything I do at thethoughtfulgamer.com, written stuff, podcasts, videos, random thoughts on occasion. It's all there. Uh, you can subscribe to make sure all that gets to your email inbox. Put your email in the box. It's right on the front page. You'll, you won't miss it. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that or support everything that we do at The Thoughtful Gamer. Go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Uh, please rate and review this podcast on your podcast getting location. And I completely forgot what the other thing is that I say during these conclusions, but who cares? Sometimes you tweet and use uh, Oh, Instagram. yeah, social media. I haven't yet fled Twitter, so I'm there. <laughs> Some people have. I'm, I'm just going to stick around and see what happens. At the very least, it'll be entertaining, I think. Uh, also on Instagram and Facebook. That was, thank you, Ryan. That was the other thing. A hundred episodes in and I still can't nail the outro. So at least we got that going for us. Maybe episode 200. <laughs> Maybe by then I'll have it. <laughs> Probably not, but that's all right with me. Yeah, a hundred episodes. We made it. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>